So look at this narrow passage between the north of Morocco and the southern part of the Spanish region. It's called the Strait of Gibraltar. There are only 8 miles between the two continents, but for some reason, there's no bridge, despite people having been dreaming for centuries about connecting these two regions. There are places in the world where a bridge over water stretches for a much greater distance. For example, the Lake Pontchartrain Causeway near New Orleans, Louisiana goes for 24 miles, which is three times the length of the hypothetical bridge between Africa and Europe. That's listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest continuous bridge passing over water. It consists of two parallel bridges and connects the urban area of New Orleans with small settlements in the north of Lake Pontchartrain. 9,000 concrete piles hold more than 1,000 decks above the water. This large-scale structure was built in the middle of the 20th century. It only took 14 months from the start of construction to its completion. American engineers created a unique technology for attaching concrete piles to the base of the bridge. And this bridge is still functioning. So what's the problem with building a shorter bridge to connect Africa and Europe? Let's first find out the value of the 8-mile bridge that could connect two continents and the reason why everyone is talking about it. In fact, the value of such a bridge would be enormous. Diamonds, oil, minerals… Africa is full of valuable materials, and Europe is happy to buy these things. This theoretical bridge could allow people to transport things for trade quickly and comfortably. But now, the exchange of goods between Africa and Europe is only possible thanks to airplanes and cargo ships, and airplanes are extremely expensive because of hefty fuel price tags. In addition, air travel is often delayed because of bad weather. There are long customs procedures in transportation from the airport to the destination. Ships can also be a problem. The narrow area of the Mediterranean Sea, where the two continents are closest to each other, is a dangerous place because of storms and strong currents. The transportation of your diamonds is highly dependent on weather conditions. The second advantage of such a bridge would be the creation of tens of thousands of jobs. People from Europe and Africa would build hotels, ports, parks, and even small towns for each other. The coastal parts of both continents would become a new economic center. And just imagine how much investment those places would attract. Europe and Africa would be much closer than ever before. You could drive from a small Spanish town to a safari park in northern Morocco, buy Moroccan tea, get some argan oil, and go home for the evening. Or you could take a high-speed train across the beautiful Mediterranean Sea. People would open hundreds of restaurants, amusement parks, shopping malls, and a museum next to this bridge. But unfortunately, it's impossible to build such a bridge, at least at the moment. And here's why. The main problem is the Strait of Gibraltar itself, because of its strong currents and seismic activity. How can you start large-scale construction if, in a couple of days, an underwater earthquake can trigger giant waves and take all the ships underwater? Even if you build a bridge, rapid streams of water that constantly change direction can shake the entire structure and tear the connecting parts of the construction. The bridge over the Strait of Gibraltar must have a strong, sturdy system that will withstand seismic activity. Huge resources are required to create such a complex structure. Despite the dangerous passage between the two continents, it remains one of the busiest points in the world. It's the only place on the planet connecting the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. About 300 ships pass through this area every day. Not only merchant ships, but also fishing vessels and tourist boats. There are not so many places in the world where you can watch whales coming out of the water. Not only people, but also marine creatures often visit this passage because of the peculiarities of the sea currents. But we'll talk about that later. Another problem is the depth of the strait. In simple words, any bridge over the water is built on long metal piles. Builders and engineers stick piles into the seabed and use them as a holding base for the whole construction. But installing such piles firmly enough is a difficult task because of the uneven seabed. The seabed has a unique geological landscape, irregularities, and different densities of the Earth's rock. 
There are also reefs, rocks, and pits. Any seabed requires extensive geological studies before piles are installed. However, the bottom of the Strait of Gibraltar is especially difficult because of its depth – almost 3,000 feet. It's one of the deepest straits in the whole world. Just imagine, you'll need the height of 10 Statues of Liberty to reach the surface of the water from the bottom of the strait. What kind of pile should be used there to hold the entire bridge? Most likely, one pile will have to consist of several parts connected into one large metal rod. And don't forget about seismic activity. Let's say you've installed perfectly strong piles, but the next day, an earthquake occurs and destroys the entire structure. And a strong current is carrying fortifications all over the Mediterranean Sea. The next problem is probably the most important one, because it concerns marine life. The Strait of Gibraltar has a high salt content. This natural element makes water heavier and makes it descend to the bottom of the deep Mediterranean basin. Then, this salt water pushes up cold water from the seabed into the Atlantic Ocean. These changes in water density, as well as fast currents, create sea vortices and turbulence. It's like a raging cauldron of cold water that raises a lot of nutrients to the surface. The hollows and hills of the Strait of Gibraltar are filled with different substances and sunlight, and this creates ideal conditions for the formation of phytoplankton. Whales, dolphins, and other marine creatures adore this delicacy. That's why you can see about seven species of whales and dolphins in this place. What might happen to phytoplankton after the start of global construction? Carbon dioxide, crushed rock, tons of dust and ashes, falling building materials – all of this could significantly pollute the environment. Without phytoplankton, many fish would go extinct. Without fish, thousands of fishers wouldn't be able to get food and earn money. But even if the bridge was built, cars and trains would continue to pollute the air and water. This disruption of the delicate balance in this narrow strait can lead to larger-scale environmental disasters. Dolphins and whales may leave to look for food elsewhere, and thus take resources from other marine inhabitants. Like falling dominoes, one problem can follow another. And all this because of one bridge. In 2007, the Spanish Ministry of Environmental Protection introduced speed limits for all ships sailing through the strait in order to not disrupt the delicate balance of nature. At the beginning of the 20th century, a French engineer proposed a project of a bridge, but it was rejected because it was too complicated and costly. People also tried to develop a 23-mile-long tunnel, but this project also faced financial and technical difficulties. People are still dreaming of a bridge over the Strait of Gibraltar. Perhaps in the future, when we develop cooler technologies, we'll be able to build this thing. Oh, by the way, there hasn't always been water between these two regions. In the distant past, the two continents were connected. The entire Mediterranean Sea is the remains of the Tetis Sea that existed before the era of dinosaurs. Then the African and Indian plates collided with the Eurasian one, and the Tetis Sea completely disappeared. In its place, a land bridge was formed that separated the Mediterranean Sea from the ocean. Without access to water, the sea dried up about 6 million years ago. But then, when the bridge came down, the water began to fill the dried-up pool. For tens of thousands of years, the narrow plate sank lower and lower, and the Mediterranean Sea eventually got its current water levels. In Asia, there's a bridge that is way longer than you'd think should even be possible. The HZMB stretches 34 miles over open water, which makes it the longest sea bridge in the world. So if something this massive can make it across rough waters, why can't New Zealand just build a bridge between its two main islands? After all, we're talking about a distance of just 14 miles. And a bridge like that could seriously change life for both locals and tourists. People could just hop in a car and drive from Wellington to Picton. No more ferry hassles, no more drawn-out trips. Just one epic road journey with ocean views on both sides. So what's stopping them? Well, turns out, everything. I mean, building a bridge there is technically possible, but there are a couple reasons why experts are like, hmm, maybe not. 
Let's start with the obvious, the distance. The North Island and the South Island are separated by Cook Strait. Like I said, it's 14 miles wide at its narrowest point. That's not much, true. Plus, we've got the HZMB bridge, proving that, yep, it is technically possible to build a bridge over the sea to cover that distance. But we can't ignore the fact that New Zealand's geography is, well, a whole different ballgame. Cook Strait isn't exactly a calm, friendly stretch of water. It's deep, really deep. Parts of it drop to about 10,000 feet. That's like stacking seven Empire State buildings on top of each other. It's also a rough, moody stretch of ocean that loves tossing around ships like rubber ducks. In fact, quite a few have been wrecked in Cook Strait. And sadly, many lives were lost. You don't have to worry about it so much though, as the worst accidents happened a long time ago. The ships and ferries that cross it today are much safer. Even so, it'd be pretty hard to avoid getting seasick while crossing it. Things get even messier below the surface. The seafloor over there is uneven and unpredictable. What happens is that Cook Strait has opposing tides at each end, one where it meets the Tasman Sea and the other where it joins the Pacific Ocean. And they simply don't move together like you might expect. When the tide is high on one side, it's low on the other, and they're totally out of sync. So all that water rushes back and forth through the strait to balance things out creating some really strong and messy currents in the middle. Then there's the weather. Cook Strait isn't just windy, it's probably one of the windiest places in the Southern Hemisphere. That's because it's located right in the middle of one of New Zealand's three big wind tunnels. Basically, there are places where the wind doesn't just come and go quickly. It sticks around, blowing hard for most of the year. And all of this happens because of something called the Roaring Forties. That's the name for the latitude band between 40 and 50 degrees south of the equator, where strong, persistent westerly winds are pretty common. Unlike the northern hemisphere, which has a lot of land at this latitude, the southern hemisphere is mostly ocean with just a few land masses, like New Zealand's South Island, Tasmania, and the southern tip of South America. So, these winds go wild because there's nothing to slow them down and they just keep picking up speed. The gusts there can reach up to 150 miles per hour. So imagine trying to cross a bridge in a car when the wind is actively pushing against you. That's not just unpleasant, it's super dangerous. Drivers can easily lose control of their cars with the wind pushing them sideways. And of course, that can lead to countless serious accidents. Now, let's talk about earthquakes. New Zealand sits right on the boundary of two massive tectonic plates, the Indo-Australian and Pacific plates. It's basically in the middle of a collision zone. And about 14,000 earthquakes happen in and around the country every year. Of those, only about 200 are big enough to be felt. Still, building a massive bridge under these conditions would require some serious genius-level engineering. With all that in mind, we can safely say that the whole bridge idea is off the table. But how about an underwater tunnel? Yep, that could work. It could be a great solution, actually. No wind, no bad weather, and no earthquakes to deal with. There are a bunch of other advantages, too. First, it would dramatically reduce travel time, cutting down the three to four hour sailing trip between the North and South Islands. That same journey would probably only take about 40 minutes. Then people wouldn't have to stress about all the ferry cancellations and delays because of bad weather. And most importantly, it's doable. I mean, look at the Channel Tunnel. It's an undersea tunnel connecting southern England and northern France. Japan did something similar with the Seikan Tunnel, which connects the islands of Honshu and Hokkaido. They are both huge projects, serving pretty much the same purpose. So why on earth isn't New Zealand already building this tunnel? Well, for the same reason we don't all live in luxury treehouses with personal robots. Money. Estimates vary, but some experts think a project like this could cost anywhere from 10 to 20 billion dollars. To cover that kind of cost, they'd probably need to charge tolls for the next hundred years. And trust me, 
those tolls wouldn't be cheap. Other experts think it could actually cost more than that. Because you see, we have to consider all the extra infrastructure. The narrowest point of Cook Strait is between the North Island and Arapoa Island. That's one of the long, mountainous regions in the Marlborough Sounds, which is pretty remote. So it's not just about the cost of the bridge or tunnel itself, it's also the access roads, safety systems, maintenance, and evacuation plans. You can't just build a huge underwater tunnel and not plan for the occasional emergencies. And what would it actually be used for? Sure, there are people who travel between the islands. About a million passengers take the ferry every year. But that's not exactly the kind of traffic that justifies the most expensive infrastructure project in the country's history. Earlier, we talked about how England and Japan have similar underwater tunnels. But there's something to consider. The United Kingdom has a population of 69 million. Japan has even more, with around 123 million people. And in New Zealand, they've only got 5 million residents to pay for this project. So could they have a tunnel under Cook Strait? Sure they could. Should they? Oh, uh, probably not. If you don't want to fly, the only other way to travel between the islands is by ferry. It's not ideal, but hey, it works. New Zealand has a total of five ships that transport people and vehicles across the islands. For tourists who aren't in a rush, it's perfect. You can cross the islands while taking in some of the most stunning views and spotting amazing wildlife. You'll start your trip in Wellington, and right from there, you'll see the rugged North Island coastline as you head out into open water. You might see different seabirds like gulls and terns, and as you get closer to the South Island, you might spot some gannets. If you're lucky, you could also catch a glimpse of the seal colonies off the coast. During the last hour of the trip, the ferry will slow down, giving you plenty of time to enjoy the green hills and calm waters. You will also approach Queen Charlotte Sound, a spot known for its wildlife. So keep an eye out for orcas, playful dolphins, and even penguins. Honestly, having a ferry instead of a tunnel might not be so bad after all. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.